In this how-to video, we're going to examine how to do float-based assignment for your project. Writing software emphasizes that the only way to assign resources to your project is based on float. You don't assign based on what is more important or what the customer wants to see. You assign it solely based on float, low to high. By doing so, you will have the safest way of assigning the resources because the lower the float, the riskier the activity is. And so if you address those activities first, you reduce the overall risk of your project. It is also the most efficient way of assigning resources because it minimizes the downtime where resources are idle. And finally, float-based assignment allows you to trade resources for float, which reduces the amount of resources required for your project. And by doing so, you reduce the overall cost for your project. So you find the least costly way of developing the system. The easiest way of calculating the float for your project is to use Microsoft Project. In float-based assignment, and in general in project design, you only use total float. The way to calculate it in Microsoft Project is to add the column total slack. Microsoft just calls it slack as opposed to float. In the demo I will do, I will just rename it to float just because. The idea is very simple. All activities in the project have some level of float, but not all activities have the same amount of float. The least amount of float is, of course, the critical activities, but you can have near critical activities or activities with a high level of float. In this case, I'm even doing color coding of float. So imagine that this is some kind of a timeline representation of activities, and I have four activities. If all four activities can start at the same time, I could use as many as four developers, just assign them one for each activity. Now, I could also do the same project you see here on the slide using two developers. I will take the first developer and assign that developer to the first activity. Take the second developer and assign it to activity two. There's no point in deferring that. It has little float. But now what I will do is I will push activity three further down the timeline until after activity two is finished. By doing so, I will reduce the float of activity three. In this case, it went from uh, yellow to red. But now developer two can jump to activity three. I can do the same for activity four, and this would, of course, reduces the float of activity four, but I can still do it with two developers. So in this case, not only did I do float-based assignment, I also traded float for resources. So again, note, I assigned the resource to the activity with the lowest float first, always, and I also traded float for resources. This is the essence of float-based assignment. In the demo, I will take the normal solution from chapter 11, and I will show you how to staff it using float. And so I'm jumping into Microsoft Project here. The first thing you do whenever you open a Microsoft Project file is sort it, so make sure exactly where you are. Let's just sort it by ID. Next, I'd like to do some color coding. Color coding is good because of task continuity. I'd like to make sure that developers that do a particular kind of task keep doing that kind of task. It's also a good idea to actually use color coding so that you can see uh, what is the next type of activity you should be assigning to. In addition, I'd like to also do color coding of milestone, which don't require, of course, any kind of a resource. Let's actually start it sorted by start date. And I would color code the milestone. In milestones, I'd like to do uh, highlights as opposed to just color coding. And so let's do the second milestone the same way. So now I know I don't need to assign any resource over here. Let's do some color coding for the front end activities. Let's do color coding for some test activities. Again, this has nothing to do with float-based assignment. It's just a very nice way of doing the assignment later on. So I have the two test activities here in red. Might as well make this one red. What else? Maybe database activities. Make that some kind of green. And so on. OK. Whenever you assign resources to a project, you have to follow your project's planning assumption. 
In this case, we assume that an architect is going to do the first uh, activities in the front end, so we assign the architect to all of them. Whenever you're doing assignment, do the easy things first. And so it's also easy to assign a test engineer. And I'm going to assign test engineer over here. And also over here. Also according to the planning assumption, the system testing activity is done by quality control testers. In fact, two of them. What we have left now is the need to assign developers. And so I'm going to add another column here, which is total slack. And if you don't like to see total slack, you can actually rename it. We're just going to call it float. And so, again, let's sort it by the start date, making sure. So we see that on 4.15 we have a bunch of activities. And this activity has zero days of float, and so we're going to assign developer one here first. One way of doing assignment is taking a particular resource and following the timeline of that resource through the project. And so developer one is working from 4.15 to 5.3, so developer one pops back on the network on 5.3. 5.3 is a Friday. The following Monday is 5.6. So we can actually look at around 5.6 for an activity for that developer to do. And indeed on 5.6, we see two activities, one with zero days of float, one with 15 days of float. Obviously, we're going to assign it to the zero days of float because we do float-based assignment. Now, the developer is popping back on the network on 5.31, following Monday 6.3. Again, we look for activities around 6.3 that has the least amount of float, and it's obviously going to be this one. And now we have 621. Again, look at around 624, least amount of float would be activity 15. 626, and then we can see here that the following weekend is 729. Least amount of float is this activity. 823, following weekend is 826. And developer one is now actually done with this project. And we have assigned that developer based on float throughout the project. Now it's assigned the second developer. Again, we look at uh, the beginning of the project, 4.15. We can see that there's two activities, one 30 days of float, one 45 days of float. Of course, we always assign based on float, and so we do the first activity, the one with 30 days of float. Let's make that be developer two. Now, developer two could actually now go and do uh, the next activity, but suppose for task continuity, I want to give it a green task. If I want to give it a green task, and I would just give it the activity 9 over here, Microsoft Project is going to complain because the developer can't really do two activities at the same time, and on the left you see an angry red man indicator saying that's not okay. The correct way of solving it is to move activity 9 down the timeline and consume its float, so reduce it from 45 days to some other number. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the predecessors here. So I'm going to click here F2, and I'm going to add dependency between 9 and 10. Now note I'm making 9 depend on 10, not 10 depend on 9, because 9 has more float. If I do that, project automatically scheduled the activity to the correct uh, uh, date after um, Activity 10 is complete. Unfortunately, I also just changed the project, and nobody actually knows I did that. So I'd like to document it. So I'm adding another column here, and I'm going to call it resource dependency. Now, this is just a freeform field I just invented. And what I'm doing now, I'm documenting the fact that dependency 10 is actually artificial. I added it because of the dependency on the resource. Recall also from the book that resource dependencies are dependencies. Fundamentally, the project network is a network of dependencies, not a network of activities. So now developer 2 is done 531. Let's look at around 63 for low float activity. It's obviously this one. You can just copy the resource. And then 
what else uh, can we do with uh, developer two? Again, we could say that for in the interest of task uh, continuity, we can assign uh, the next green task for developer two. Of course, if I were to just assign developer two, again, I would have over allocation. Since activity 11 has more flow than activity 12, I will make activity 11 depend on activity 12. And I would again document it on the side. Let's finish assigning developer 2. Developer 2 is popping back on network on 621. Look around 624. We have this activity with five uh, days of float. Let me also just fix the color here. I just do it this way. And then developer 2 is popping back on the network on 719. We have a little bit of downtime for developer 2 in that case, but we can pick up this activity over here. And then we have the ability of doing the activity at 92. And developer 2 is done with this network. All we have to do is plug the rest of the resources over here. We can use developer 3. And 510, and long downtime, and then developer 3 can come over here. And now the project is fully staffed. So you can see how you use float to assign resources. You always look for the next available activities when the resource pops back on the network based on float. If there's an existing activity ready to go, you pick the one with the lowest amount of float, based, of course, on task continuity. If there isn't a ready activity, but there's an activity that you can consume some float and move it down the timeline, you do that. And the result is the safest, most efficient, and least expensive way of assigning resources to the project. For more on project design, let me refer you to writing software.